Well, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 15. When the lights come up, there we go. Luke chapter 15, we're going to continue our study in the red letters this morning. Uh, you know, for a few weeks now, we've been studying this series, and the, the, the title of the series comes from, uh, your, from really from your own Bibles. When you look in the Gospels, you see the words of Jesus in red, the red letters. The idea came from a guy named Louis Klops in 1899. One day while he was studying the scriptures, he was the editor for the Christian Herald newspaper in London. He came across a verse in Luke 22, verse 20, says that, that this cup that's poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And when he read that, he was so impressed by the symbolism of the blood that the idea of writing the words of Jesus in red came to him and it stuck and we've had it ever since, which I think is kind of a neat idea. Well, when we, uh, when we started this series, the intent was to look at some of the most prolific teachings of Christ and most of these, not well, in this, in this case, all these come from parables. Parables are an earthly story with a spiritual point. It's a story in which we take that which is unfamiliar and use the familiar to describe it. And Jesus was a master at using parables. Well, today we're going to look at what is arguably the most notable of all of the parables. It's the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the lost sons. So if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 15, we're going to investigate this passage today. I want you to follow along with me. Verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country where he squandered his wealth and wild living. Let me kind of give you a little running commentary here. He went to his dad and he said, Dad, I wish you were dead. Because that was the only way to get his inheritance. And so his dad said, okay, you wish I was dead? Here you go. Not, after that, long, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set out for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth and wild living. He just lived in complete rebellion. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. This is the wages of sin. So he went out and hired himself out as a citizen to the citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Folks, this is a real quick scenario of what sin does. Sin always leads to death. It always leads to destruction. It always leads to bankruptcy. And this guy found himself at the bottom of the barrel. Now, verse 17 is a very significant verse. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I will set out, go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it, on his, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring a fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead, is now alive again. He was lost and now he's found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the, was in the field. When he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home. He replied, your father has killed the fattened calf because he has, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. And he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My, father, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours, but we have, we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead, is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. You know, when you look at this story, there's several things that are important. Number one, you got to look at the audience. Who is Jesus speaking to? And then also, what is he saying? This parable is the third of three parables. There's the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the lost sons. 
And it's very important to get this because Jesus is actually speaking to them about several points. One is that he's speaking of the Father's love, he's the Father's pursuit. Jesus is saying, look, God will come and seek you out as a shepherd goes after a son. He will turn your life upside down. He'll turn everything upside down to find the value of this lost coin, which is you. And then the third parable is not just the father's love and the father's waiting to receive, but also it has within it the responsibility that you and I have as those who are lost and how we come back to the father. Also important is to note who this, who he's speaking to. If you go back to verse one, you'll see that it says, it says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around him to hear. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners to eat with him. And then Jesus launches into these parables. Two groups of people, the tax collectors, sinners, and the Pharisees. Now, this is a great, this, this is of, of incredible significance because, one, who are the tax collectors? The tax collectors were the sellouts. They were the people that, that no one liked because they were Jews who had sold themselves out to Rome to collect taxes from the Jews on behalf of Caesar. So nobody liked them. They thought, this, they, they thought these guys were, 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 were sellouts. And then you have the Pharisees who were the religious pious, those who looked down their noses and they thought they were better than everybody else. And so what you really have here is a picture of our lostness. Now, someone just asked me, you know, he's talking about two sons. Yes, but, but this, the reference here is of the parable is not that these sons have a relationship with the father, but rather that these sons were of the creation of the father. And so when we look at it, this is about lostness. And we're going to see when someone's found their celebration, but really it's about the condition of a man, a condition of a woman, a condition of all of us, and the Father's relentless pursuit for every one of us to have a relationship with him. So what do we see in the tax collector and in the, in the Pharisees? We see the two types of lost people. We see, the, we see the rebellious lost and we see the religious lost. Now, do you know what the rebellious lost and the religious lost have in common? This is profound, you ready? They're lost. It doesn't matter whether they're, it doesn't matter how close they are to the cross or how far they are from the cross. It doesn't matter how much they talk about God, how much they ignore the topic of God. They're lost. And they are in need of the forgiveness of the Father. And that really is the heart of the story here is forgiveness. We all need the Father's forgiveness. So what is forgiveness? Forgiveness, whether it's whether it's from a man to another man or whether it's from God to us, forgiveness is the greatest of all miracles. Forgiveness is a gift. A gift can't be earned. A gift is not something you and I deserve. A gift is something that's given to us from, by someone else. In this particular case, forgiveness is a gift from someone who you've offended. It's something you don't deserve. It's something that you can't earn. And yet this person who you've offended in, in mercy and in grace, they give you something that you cannot get for yourself. I don't care how much penance you give. I don't care how much you twist the story. There is no way to change the fact that forgiveness, all forgiveness is a gift. Now, when it comes to the gift of God, it goes to a whole new level because none of us deserve God's gift of grace. None of us deserve forgiveness. Yet God, who is rich in mercy, gave us something that we cannot have for ourselves. And he did it by sending his son to die on the cross to pay for our sins. You know, the truth is there are a number of misconceptions about forgiveness, many of which where people think that I can do something to earn it. I can do something to deserve it. I'm going to make it very clear. Not one of us in this room deserve God's forgiveness. Not one of us. No matter how good you are, how bad you are. No matter how much you go to church, how much you don't go to church. No matter how many old ladies you help across the street, no matter how many Girl Scout cookies you sell, no matter how talented you are, no matter how much money you give, not one of us in this room can ever earn or deserve God's forgiveness. If, it, if we could, then it wouldn't be a gift. And yet we find in Ephesians, 
chapter two, it says, for by grace, you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it's the free gift of God, not, of work, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. By definition, grace is a gift the recipient doesn't deserve and he can't earn. Yet it's the result of God's initiative. And that's the way all forgiveness is. The only way any of us in this room can have forgiveness is that someone has to take the initiative and give it to us. You ready for this? The only, one any, the only way anyone will ever experience forgiveness from you is if you take the initiative and dispense it to them. Because forgiveness is a gift. It's a gift that comes only because someone gives it to us. Now, with that said, I was listening to something this week and, and it really sparked a thought in my head that, that I think is important. In church, I hear all the time, you know what, I'm saved by faith. And as I started thinking about that, I thought, you know what, that is an untrue statement. There's not one of us in this room who has earned God's forgiveness, who gets God's forgiveness because of faith. If that were the case, then as long as you have faith in something, then you'd be forgiven. You could have faith that, in that camera over there. You could have faith in the pew you're sitting in. We, we, we exercise faith every day, don't we? Faith cannot save you. It cannot rescue you. It cannot give you forgiveness. What does? God's grace. It's for by grace, it's because of the work of Christ. It's because of his shed blood on the cross. It's because he came and became a man and lived a sinless life and took our sin upon him, became our scapegoat and was crucified on the third day, raised from the dead. And because of that event, that is God's grace. God, who is rich in mercy, then says, here's my grace to cover your sin, to give you forgiveness. And we don't put our faith in anything. Our faith is in God's grace. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Listen to this passage of scripture, Acts chapter four, verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In Ephesians 1, 7, it says, in Christ, that is in Christ alone, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sin. So the first thing about forgiveness that's important for us to understand, and we see this in the story of the prodigal son, the father wants to give forgiveness. He wants every one of us in this room to experience his forgiveness. It's a free gift. It's a gift of God. But with that comes a second item. Forgiveness requires man's repentance. It requires our response to what he has done for us. And that's the, that's the real heart, in my opinion, that's one of the major lessons of this story. So what I wanna to do today is teach you a very important truth, and I hope to, that you will put this in your, your spiritual uh, toolbox so that you can use this in teaching others. I, I can't begin to tell you how many times I've taught the process of biblical repentance. I, I remember hearing, hearing this message when I was 13 years old. I was at First Baptist Atlanta, and I heard the story of the prodigal son for the first time. And then that, the, the, the person speaking unpacked what it took in order for us to have a relationship with God. I think in the story, we have not just the picture of repentance for a person who is lost and needs to be saved, needs to be found. But I think really we also find the picture of repentance even for people who are followers of Christ who have turned their back, walked away, or not living in intimacy with God. And so if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that's all part of this process of repentance. And so I want to unpack that for you today, share with you, teach you, hopefully arm you and equip you, because I can promise you if you get this lesson, not only will it help you, but you will have something in your spiritual toolbox, in your ministry that will help you when you're talking with other people, whether it be a friend, whether it be a family member, 
whatever. This is a great lesson to teach us about repentance. First thing I want you to see is the father has, comes to, when the son comes to the father, the son says, dad, I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance. And the father gives it to him. And then he takes it and goes and lives like the devil. This rebellious person, he's living. Not only does it say, God, I wish you were, or dad, I wish you were dead. He, he says, I'm going to live like you don't exist. And certainly there are plenty of people in our world that live this way, rebellious to the things of God, to the heart of God. Now, very important principle, God will allow that. Whether you're a Christian or whether you're not, whether you're a Christ follower or not, God will allow you to live in complete rebellion and live as if he doesn't exist. Because it doesn't it doesn't deny, it doesn't, just because you don't think God exists doesn't mean God doesn't exist. <laughs> so God will allow that to happen. But when you choose to live this way, you're also going to find the consequences of sin and what they'll do to you. Now, let me kind of begin by, by sharing that every one of us are in, in the relationship. And so this is, this is our relationship with God. And we're walking in this relationship. Every one of us are going to come to a fork in the road. Not once, not twice, but countless times through the day. We're going to find ourselves having to make a choice. Am, am I going to choose to walk with God or am I going to choose to walk away from God? My own choice. And so when you come to the first, this first decision, you can either, and I'm going to use a different color here. You can either respond to God and if you respond to him, then you'll continue in relationship. Pretty simple, isn't it? If we'd only do that. But what happens so often is that we choose, instead of to respond to God, we choose to rebel. We choose a, right, a way that seems right to ourselves. Now here's the big thing about when we choose our own way apart from God. It's called sin. The book of James says, he who knows to do right but doesn't do it, it is, guess the word, sin. And sin separates us from God. Sin affects our relationship. If, you, if, you're, if you've never come to know Christ, you just remain in separation. If you come to know Christ as your Savior, instead of having intimacy with him, you sever that intimacy. I've used this example before. I think I used it well in the last two weeks. I have four children. No matter what happens, they're my children. They've been born to me. If you've seen my children, if you've seen my wife, they're like little mini me's. They're running out. They have been marked. They have been branded. Now, just because they're born to us doesn't mean that we have great relationships. That requires that we walk together, we talk, we communicate, that they respond. And so whenever our children act good, then they're acting just like their father. Whenever they don't act good, they are acting like their father. In the first service, when I said that, I could feel my wife, the, the, the vision burning a hole into the side of my head. Here's the thing about it, though. All rebellion, all rebellion, anytime we choose a way that's opposite of the way that would keep us in relationship with the Father, it always leads to ruin. Always. It might not be immediate, but it will come. The wages of sin is death. You will reap what you sow. Anytime that we choose a way that is opposite of the heart of God, it, it, which is sin, sin always has consequences. For some, that sin can lead to death. For others, that lead, that it can lead to a broken relationship. It can lead to problems and pain and difficulty. But sin always leads to ruin. In the prodigal son, look where it brought him. It brought him busted, bankrupt, and in the, the, a Jewish boy in a pigsty eating leftovers. He found the bottom of the barrel of life because that's what sin always does. Satan authors it. He has come to kill, steal, and destroy. 
And so if you think, if we think that, that sin is going to be great fun, there's never going to be consequences, you have already been duped and you're in trouble. The wages of sin is always death. It always leads to ruin. It always leads to destruction. Here's the way you can look at it. Sin is a dead end. It's always a dead end. Sin is a dead end. Say that with me. Sin is a dead end. Always. Now, when you, when you finally hit the bottom, you are now faced with a second choice. You can either, and this is what a lot of people do, you can rationalize it, or you can realize it. What do most people do? We'll find ourselves at the bottom of the barrel and then we'll, we'll, we'll start saying, well, you know, uh, this really isn't that bad or I'm here because it was Lee. Lee is the person to blame. I'm in my situation because of Lee. And we start figuring out someone else to blame rather than owning it, rather than dealing with our situation, we rationalize it. When you rationalize your sin, when you rationalize your rebellion in your ruin, it just makes matters worse. You just stay there. You're stuck. It's like quicksand. But I love the fact that we learn what to do from the prodigal son. One of my favorite lines of this passage, it says, when he came to his senses, he realized his situation. And he realized that he didn't want to be there. He didn't need to be there. He shouldn't be there. But he was there because of his decision to rebel from the father. When you get to this place, there's hope. You are in, you're, you're in the groove. You're in the sweet spot of being able to discover God's forgiveness. And so instead of rationalize it, he realized it, and that led to a decision. He could either run from God, or he could run or return to God. And this is the word that we use or repent. Now, I love what happened. There's a very important principle here. He's sitting there in his stank, and he says, what am I doing here? I don't have to be here. I can go back to my father's house, and I can go to him and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you. Very important principle there. You sin against God, but your sin affects everyone else. He says, I guess heaven and, and my sin has affected you. I'm not worthy to be called one of, your, one of your son. Would you make me one of your hired men? And he's sitting there and he's thinking about it. Now, here's the important principle. Thinking about repentance and repenting are not the same. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, I know I need to do this. I know I need to do this. I know I've got to get this right with God. And they never do it. That's not repentance. But we see his repentance because after he comes up with the plan, it says he got up and he returned to the Father. Repentance is turning from sin to God. And that's what this guy did. He says, I don't want to live here anymore. I don't want to be in this mess. I'm going to get up and I'm going to return to the Father. And when he comes to the Father, he actually says what he needs to say. Now, I love the fact that there's a great lesson about, about God's grace and God's forgiveness, and that is God is ready to forgive you. Now, what is a distant country? Because that's what it says. He, he turned and went to a distant country. A distant country, whether you are a thousand miles away or one step away, it's when you turn your back on God and you start doing it your way. What's awesome here is in the story is that when he turned, the father was waiting for him. The father was looking for him. And the amazing thing for us is that God is looking for every one of us. He's looking us for us to turn from our way to his way. And he brings us so he can have a relationship with us. And the scripture says that he runs out, grabs his, father, grabs his son, and as his son begins to share, hey, I've, I've sinned against God, I've sinned against you, he, he says, just kill the fattened calf, put a ring on his finger. He restores him to relationship. And the beauty of that is, is that forgiveness 
only requires the grace of God, the mercy of God. You've got to get right vertically. David said that. In Psalm 51, after David blew it with, with Bathsheba, he, goes, he says, God, against you and you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. He says, create in me a clean heart. He throws himself on the mercy of God and God gives mercy to him. Now, here's where it gets very interesting. How do I know if I'm truly repentant? How can I know if someone that I love, someone I care about, someone I know, if they've done something wrong, how can I know if, they've truly, if they're truly repentant and got it right with God? It's evidenced by the next two things. I've labeled these repair or refuse. When you get right vertically, you have an obligation, you are compelled to get right horizontally. If someone says, listen, I've blown it. I've sinned against God and my sin has infected. If I look at Jonathan and I say, Jonathan, I blew it. I sinned against God and my sin has affected you, infected you. If I'm truly repentant, I will go to Jonathan and say, Jonathan, I blew it. Will you forgive me? I've asked God to forgive me. And the beauty is, is that God has a 100% guarantee of forgiveness when we genuinely turn to him. You got that? 100%. It's guaranteed. But when I go to Jonathan, that's not guaranteed. In fact, he can actually look at me and go, sorry, don't want to do it. But I still have sought it. As a result of genuinely getting right with God, you will go and try to make it right with people. Now, here's the reason that's hard. Because when you go and get it right with people, You've got to make, you got to face the retribution and be willing to repay the debt. Now, you've been forgiven back here. And the evidence, though, is that you're willing to go and make it right with people and you're willing to face the consequences of your actions. If you resist that, let me show you what happens. If in your rebellion it leads to ruin, if you rationalize it, you'll stay in ruin. If you realize it, but then when you start to go, when you, when you, get, you say, you know what, I know I've blown it, but I'm afraid to face God, and you run, you return to ruin. If you refuse here, it's just evidence that you've truly not been forgiven, and you return to ruin. If you resist the consequences, all it's saying is, is that you're truly not repentant. Just because I go and get right with God doesn't mean there are not gonna be earthly consequences to my actions. You don't get a get out of hell card or get out of jail card because you go and say, God forgive me. There are still consequences to your actions. That's why righteousness and living in my faith are so critical in our day-to-day -day walk. This gift of forgiveness means that I'm, the debt has been paid in full, but there still can be consequences. If a man commits adultery, he can be truly repentant and go, God, I've done, I, I ask you to forgive me, God, and then go to his spouse and say, will you forgive me? And she may say, you know what, I forgive you for the act, but our relationship is still broken. That's an earthly consequence to a, a bad spiritual decision. Let me give you another good example. Let's go back to David. Look at all the earthly consequences 
even though he got right with God after what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah. Sons, the baby died. His, his two sons died because of his action. He lost his throne for a long period of time because those were earthly consequences to, as a result, even though he had gotten right with God. But watch this. Let's say that you've chosen to rebel and you've found yourself in ruin, but then you realize what you've done and you return to God and you will go and seek to repair that relationship and you're willing to face the consequences. Here's the awesome thing. In that event, God can bring reconciliation and restoration, not just to your relationship with him, but even to your earthly relationships. You and I, we cannot short circuit this process. We try. I, I, I've, I've heard so many times, I asked God forgive me, but I didn't ask the person, I, did, I, I didn't want to go ask the person to forgive me, or I was afraid of the consequences. Then you didn't really repent. But if you did get right with God and you've done that, then there is a great chance. With God, you have reconciliation, you have restoration. But then there's a great chance you can have reconciliation, restoration with people that your sin infected. Let me wrap this up by sharing what I think is a very important principle. The way to know that you've been forgiven is that you're willing to forgive others when they have done something to harm you, when they've done something that affected you. There's a great quote that I, I read several years ago that I, I look at often to remind me. It says, let us go to the cross to learn how we may be forgiven, and then let us linger there that we might learn how to forgive. It's a great, great truth. I gotta tell you that there might not be a greater challenge in our world today than forgiveness. To be forgiven and to learn how to forgive. When we, when we choose not to forgive, it makes us bitter. But when we choose to forgive as we've been forgiven, it makes us better. I know, because I know what's going on in so many lives in our church, many of us in this room one of our great struggles is living either with the ability to forgive and be forgiven, and we're having major consequences in our lives because either we've not turned to God and asked him to forgive us, or someone's come to us and we've not been willing to forgive. I wanna share a story with you that I, that I heard many, many years ago, and it's a story that I've, I, I may have even shared it here before, but I think it's such a great, great statement, and it, show, it illustrates the, necess, the necessity of forgiveness. There was this little boy, his name was Johnny. Johnny was about five years old, six years old, and he got his first slingshot, and he was pumped. He was out visiting his grandparents, gets his slingshot, and he gets rocks, and he gets little acorns. He's putting things there, trying to shoot, trying to learn how to do it, and he can't hit the broadside of a barn. He misses everything. And he's kind of frustrated and he's trying to figure it out. Then all of a sudden, grandmother's pet duck walks by. And in a, in a, in a moment of stupidity and blindness, he grabs a rock, puts it in there, aims, and for the first time in his life, he hits his mark, kills the duck. And at first he's like, woohoo! And then all of a sudden he realizes it's the pet duck and he goes, <gasps> and he panics. Well, about that time, he looks over, and his sister, his older sister, sees him, and she goes, I saw it. <laughs> and she comes to him, and she goes, don't worry, though, I'm not going to tell Grandma. Well, at dinner that night, they're sitting there talking, and, and time for the dishes to be washed, and the grandmother says, hey, Sally, why don't you come help me wash the dishes tonight? And Sally looks over at her brother Johnny and she goes, 
No, I, I don't need to because Johnny has volunteered to do the dishes. Haven't you, Johnny? <laughs> wink, wink. Whisper, remember the duck. So Johnny does the dishes. Well, then Grandpa comes as the dishes are getting washed. Grandpa comes in and says, hey, we got a couple hours of light. Who wants to go fishing? And Johnny goes, I do. And Sally goes, and, and Grandma goes, oh, no, no, Sally, you can't go because I need help getting ready. We're having a big breakfast in the morning, and, and I really need, to, need some help in the kitchen. And Sally goes, oh, that's okay, Grandma. Johnny's volunteered to help you do that. Haven't you, Johnny? Remember the duck. Of course, he stays. Well, this goes on for two or three days. I mean, two or three days, and this kid is miserable. His sister has, her, has him under her thumb until finally he can take it no more, and he runs up to his grandmother, hugs her, buries his face into her, into, into her and, he, and he just says, Grandma, I killed your duck. Will you forgive me? And the grandma wraps her arms around him. And she goes, oh, Johnny, I know you, you killed the duck. I was looking out the kitchen window and saw everything. I was just wondering how long you're going to let your sister hold you captive. Living with unforgiveness in your life, you allow the devil, you allow other people, you even allow yourself to hold yourself captive where you do not get to experience the blessings of God. In the story of the prodigal son, we see what's necessary for a person who doesn't know God to come into a relationship with God. But we also see for a person who knows God, when they fall out of relationship or intimacy with God, what's necessary to be restored to God. And in both cases, it requires the forgiveness of God, the gift of God. God is wanting, he's ready to dispense it, but we have to turn to him, repent. And if it's genuine, not only will we get right with God, we'll make it right with people, no matter what consequence we have to face. I wonder today, how many of you are living with unforgiveness, are living in a position where you need to give forgiveness and you have it? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you love us so much to tell us the truth. It is not always easy. Sometimes it's painful to hear the truth. But Lord, it's because you so desperately want a relationship with us. And you know that we are in absolute need of your grace and your mercy. Father, today in this room, it is very likely that there are people in need of your forgiveness. Some for salvation. Some people in this room, Father, may today need to say for the very first time, I'm either a rebellious lost person or a religious lost person. And I realize today that God loved me so much that he gave his only son for me. And rather than putting my faith in anything else, I want to put my faith in Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. If that's you today, you can where you are, you can simply pray to God. You can say something like this. God, I know I'm, I make mistakes. I know I sin. And I know my sin separates me from you. But I understand that you love me so much that you became a man and died on the cross to pay for my sin. And right now, the best I understand, I invite you into my life to be my Savior and to be my Lord. Help me now to live for you. There are others in this room today that you are a Christian. And you know what it's like to be forgiven. But right now, you're struggling because you've done something or something's been done to you and you're struggling with being able to forgive as Jesus forgave you and it's haunting you and it's having an impact on you. Would you today bring it to the cross and release it to him? 
right where you're sitting, you can say, God, forgive me and help me to forgive. And then there are those in this room today. The problem is not your forgiveness. The problem is your ability to forgive. You believe something so egregious has happened to you that you have a right to hold on to your pain, to hold on to the blame. But I'm here to tell you, it's not doing anything but destroying you. And God never intended for you to be in this position. He never intended any of us to be judge or jury, but rather recipients of grace who give grace. So today, would you let that go? Would you release the person or persons that you're holding a grudge against? And would you allow his grace, not just to be sufficient for you, but to be sufficient for others as well? In a moment, we're going to sing a song. and I'm going to ask you to stand. And whether you remain seated, whether you kneel in the altar, whether you stand where you are in your seat, or whether you come down to the front and use this altar, don't leave today without either being forgiven or being willing to forgive others. It matters. Let's stand together. Father, bless this invitation for your glory and your good. In Jesus' name.